Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. My name is Aaron and joining me are uh, Joe and Christian. So we've heard a lot of feedback from the ver- from the first episode and we're very excited for both the positive and the negative that we've received and we've uh, tried to implement some of those feedback in this in this next episode. One of those being uh, adding some sort of direction or organization to it in the form of topics. Yay! Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the main topic for tonight is do it right up front, so you don't need to do anything in the background. Um, after that, we'll talk about what we're drinking tonight, um, some late latest maker news, uh, some updates as far as how our past week has gone as makerspace directors. And then we'll finally talk about that main topic of doing it right. So, uh, to get us kicked off, what are you guys drinking tonight? Uh, I am uh, drinking the No Call No Show New England style APA from our local industry brew company. And uh, it's it's pretty great. Found out that my local Hick grocery store carries our local brewery's beer tonight, so I was pretty excited. Nice. Very uh, nice. I am carrying on to what actually Joe had last night because he got me itching for it, uh, and I went ahead and got myself some Spotted Cow. So I am having New Glarus Spotted Cow because why the did, heck not? Did you go to <laughs> Wisconsin? Uh, I may or may not have had to do a case in Wisconsin this morning. <laughs> so I'm amazing. I uh, I got home maybe a couple hours ago. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, if some of that showed up at the space on Thursday, nobody would be angry. <laughs> I will see All what right. I can do. <laughs> I am drinking uh, some Balvany. Single malt Scotch whiskey, twelve Ooh, years old. Wow. That yes, is some classy stuff. Yes, it is. I have like a very tiny a bit left. I found it in the back of the mini bar. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Let's see. Yeah. So the very first thing we're going to talk about is some of the news that we've uh, heard the past week. Um, one th- one of the things I found that was interesting was. Uh, the Piper 2 is released. Um, it is a, uh, a printer. It has a 3D printer that is styled kind of like the mostly printed CNC machine. So it's based mostly off of uh, 3D printed joints, 608 roller bearings, and uh, electrical conduit for the linear rails. Uh, they had a version 1, which was uh, a Cartesian style printer. And this new Piper 2 is actually a Core XY belted design. And I thought that was super interesting. And uh, Joe, you went to East Coast Rep Rap Fest, and you said you saw s- several of these working there. Yeah, I, I, they were the Piper ones, so they're kind of like a Prusa-style uh, Y-bed moving printer. But they were they were really neat. I, I was shocked at how uh, good the prints were from them, mostly because you know this is the future, and we're used to seeing linear rails on printers and. Uh, using conduit and skate bearings to make your linear axes is kind of a, a thing of the yield past from three years ago. So um, I was kind of, kind of shocked to see them, but uh, they are uh, surprisingly good. So, yeah. Yes. So the same guy that did the uh, design, the mostly printed CNC machine also made the low rider, which is the f- infinitely scalable, uh, CNC router that just kind of rolls along the bed. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, and that that's a very super and, cool design. Uh, we just saw, uh, I think, Hack Philadelphia or Hack Philly uh, Makerspace just got their uh, slightly modified lowrider uh, working last night. Um, they had a Facebook Live event going right as we were um, playing around last night, so I, I thought that was pretty cool and, and kind of apt. Yeah, that was super cool. Nice. So, and then in other news, uh, E3D announced they are dropping the beta for the um, their tool changing 3D printer, 
well, they are accepting applications for beta testers for the first 30 machines. So um, I personally think that's uh, incredibly exciting uh, after having seen and, and kind of played with the machine a little bit out on at uh, Midwest and East Coast Rep Rap Fest. So uh, that's going to be a, a printer that has four tool heads that it can pick up and drop off at incredible speeds and ridiculous repeatability. And uh, the best part about the machine is it's all going to be open source. So Woo-hoo. yeah, when they, uh, <laughs> when they finally hit a design freeze on it, they're going to release all the files out and not only just sell the mechanical platform. So it won't be a functional printer when you get it. It will be a, a mechanical platform that you can build your own, research machine for tool changing on because let's face it the software isn't here yet and uh, you know there's there's a lot of uh chains uh that are left after the machine this is kind of a uh, hey let's build it and they will come hail mary move on e3d guys and uh i'm super 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 excited about it so I know at the original um, announcement at MRF that they had talked about potentially having a pick and place style attachment head. And I think that'd be super cool to have it be able to automatically put like nuts, bolts, magnets, yeah. whatever inside the inside the part mid print and then put the thing back, get the print head back on and continue printing. Yeah. Personally, I'm super hmm. excited about the idea of hybrid manufacturing. So the, the idea of additive manufacturing and then being able to go back and uh, do finishing on your part with a uh, light duty cutter head. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like it's, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to mill aluminum with this thing. Nothing on it is super stout. So you could um, you know, be able to deal with cutter deflection. But if all you're doing is taking layer lines off of FDM printed parts and any material that we can print on a machine today, you know, that's almost no, uh, no forces on the cutter. So, uh, some really, really neat things will be able to be done with that. And I am ultra stoked on it. So. Yeah. Imagine combining the, uh, the chocolate printers with a jelly inserting head (laughs) and, (laughs) and, and frosting heads. I think just think of the possibilities. (laughs) Yeah. So many possibilities. So, and and then uh, yeah. in slightly less awesome news, we found out this week that Creality has uh, kind of gone back on their promise of staying open and following the GPL guidelines of the firmware they utilize with the CRX Boo. printer. Boo. So yeah, uh, I'm so I was so excited about. Um, the idea that Chinese companies were finally going to follow the rules with open source, but I knew it was, I I knew it was just a publicity move. Um, And now they're going to start seeing the consequences. I think Um, their printed solid has already dropped them as a supplier. And uh, I, I suspect more companies are on the way. So just frustrating. I think that was like one of the main things that like, we were pointing towards was uh, this community will very much take note when you especially first say that you're going to go open source and then decide to go closed source. This community in particular will voice their opinion on such things. And a lot of these companies should have learned their lesson when MakerBot pulled their yeah. stuff. Um, but apparently they have not, and they are very much starting to see the consequences of something like well, that. Well, and this is way worse than what MakerBot did. MakerBot just, they left all the stuff that they had open, open. They just revved the printer and made their next revolution uh, fully closed source. And, and that's okay. I, I don't like it, but it's legal. Uh, what Creality is doing is they are violating the statutes of the open source license that they utilize in the software that runs their printers. And that is both not okay on an ethical point, but it's also not okay from legal point of view. So. Yeah. I'd be really interested to see how the, the free software foundation 
handles the situation because they're kind of the ones who end up enforcing these around the world as a nonprofit. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting time. I I hope that we can, um, we can finally set some standards in that world, but you know, maybe not. So, yeah, we'll see. Well, in other open source news, Aaron, you got some cool news about steam, don't you? Yeah. yeah, so Steam actually announced a new a new uh, initiative with their latest version of the Steam Play beta. They are they have announced or I guess they've released a software called Proton, which is actually um, an upstream version of Wine, which is a uh, Windows compatibility layer to play um, Windows only games within Linux. Um, so Proton is a a upstream Wine version that Steam has also added some additional customizations to. But with all of that, they went ahead and open sourced it anyways, which is great. And what it does is it, it, it provides native Steamworks and open VR support. It uses um, DXVK integration, which is a DirectX 11 and 12 API translation layer between um, Windows and Linux. Um, so you're able to now play DirectX made games in Linux where there is no DirectX versions. Um, and that's super huge. Um, Currently, only 27 games are officially supported by Steam, but they actually included an an advanced option so that you could toggle it on and off to say, um, I'm going to go ahead and try to play some unsupported Windows games in Linux, and I'll accept any consequences. So uh, one one of the uh, results from that is that the uh, Reddit gaming community actually came together, and they started a uh, crowdsourced Google spreadsheet on all of these Windows only games and how well they run in the current version of the Steam Play beta. And, you know, the average frame rates, you know, how is the game playable um, and and different metrics like that. And the list has now amassed over 3000 titles on that spreadsheet. So um, I normally I wouldn't really consider this, you know, maker E news, but the idea is that this is going to push the Linux desktop forward you know, immensely, because I've only I've heard so many people who had said, well, I would love to try Linux, but I'm a huge gamer and all my favorite games are on Windows and only a small minority are yeah. on Linux. Now, you know, you're start, you, you'll be able to see those people switch over and Steam actually uh, they, an, they didn't announce it, but they confirmed um, from a, a forum post that if you buy a Windows only game, and you log like three or so hours on that game in the Steam Play on Linux, that will actually count as a Linux sale in their metrics. Hmm. So now all these game publishers will be able to, yeah, so all the game publishers will be able to see, oh, wow, there's actually a decent amount of people playing on Linux that we didn't had no idea of before. Because, like, yeah, I'm not going to rebuy my games for Linux, but I have a huge Steam library, and I know you guys do too, so... Mm -hmm. like that almost gives me reason to just like spend an hour a night playing video games in linux just to test and get some things done and uh you know push this forward so i actually um went ahead when uh we talked about this last uh last time and um aaron had mentioned it a little bit in uh while we were at the space and uh tried to play some games on last night and uh it actually came out pretty well uh i was able to play a little bit of street fighter and a little bit of dishonored and both actually played relatively well um there was a little bit of um frames drop during street fighter uh so my inputs weren't going in as fast as i would have liked um overall i was still able to play it though uh, right. competitively maybe not yet but it was playable dishonored same thing it was very much the graphics were there and they were awesome um they were rendering out at 60 the whole time that i was playing uh and it was going pretty smoothly the the only thing that i kind of caught every once in a while was a a few hiccups every once in a while but for the most part that is a game that is like counted as a benchmark for most of the community um right along doom which i only saw uh reviews of it and it seemed like doom 2016 was actually playing well to begin with 
Um, but everything that I played so far played nicely. Um, and that's what was really cool was just being able to kind of test it out and see that it was actually doing awesome. Well. I've actually heard some feedback on the uh, on some of the Reddit threads that some games um, are running much better on Linux than on Windows through the Steam Play, even though they're playing through a well, good two or three compatibility yeah, that layers. Makes sense because you know your operating system doesn't load your RAM sixty percent as soon as you boot. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just find it humorous right. that, that even even running these games through like three compatibility layers, it still runs right. better than on Windows. It's exciting. That says that says something. So uh, let's see. Also, the Milwaukee Maker Fair is coming up. Yeah. Rachel. So the uh, last weekend in September, uh, September 29th and 30th is going to be Milwaukee Maker Fair. And uh, if you guys haven't been to a, a one of the bigger regional maker fairs, I definitely suggest you check it out if you're in uh, the Midwest area. Um, the... Uh, Milwaukee Makerspace is um, a pretty amazing community makerspace. They've got several hundred members, and they just do a ton of awesome work in the Milwaukee area. So um, I try to do everything I can to support them, but uh, I will be at the Maker Fair this year as a guest, and I'm really, really excited because I've never actually been to a maker event as a as just like an attendee, somebody who's walking around. Uh, but I'm taking a road trip up with my daughter and we're going to go and, and uh, be spectators for once. So I'm looking forward to that. What's it like being an attendee? I, I don't know. I, for, I forget. I've never <laughs> been. I've, I've literally never been to one in, on that side of the table. So I'm, I'm interested. Right. So. Yeah, from all the uh, ones that we've been able to go to so far, because I've been able to kind of attend uh, Murph, and then we host our own Maker Fair um, that is pretty big here in uh, Peoria. Uh, just like being able to go to a Make event is something else. Um, you just get this experience of being able to see a whole bunch of people who are passionate about their craft, being able to display what they've been working on for so long. Yeah. Uh, in the process they got to get there and that's it's something that's actually like magical uh, and I would I, I would very much suggest that if you have never been to a make event please go they are so awesome and you will learn so much well and I'm excited about this too because I'm almost kind of jaded after the last four or five years of going to these as an exhibitor and starting to know more and more people in the community um I, I kind of got this feeling this last year of like, I'm not really going for the event. I'm just going for people I know and to talk to those people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of stepping back and seeing everything through my daughter's eyes uh, and you know, just like going for fun. And uh, I, so I, I've tried really hard to not see, not check out anything about the event or even see who's going to be there. So I can just actually just go there for fun and uh for the actual event so i'm looking forward to it heck yeah yeah something about if you guys are also segways are hard <laughs> let's talk about running a makerspace <laughs> <laughs> we're learning <laughs> yeah so yeah i heard we're moving i also heard we were moving man that's yeah. a thing <laughs> It's going to be a big I, thing. I, we just heard that we may potentially have 30 college students showing up to help us move. Yay! Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely find something for them to do. Hopefully. hopefully. There is such a thing as too much help, but I, I don't think <laughs> there is going to be too much on this one. I'm just going to have to go there with my yelly voice and command. <laughs> 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 right yeah so with our uh our newly announced uh makerspace move came a discussion on uh how do we handle door access uh 
in our current building, we have uh, about 55 some physical keys floating around. That's a lot of keys. And now that we're... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and somebody said, well, how are we going to get all these keys back? And I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. So it'd be way easier just to, to rekey the lock. Yep. So with the new building, you know, we're hopefully... We, we keep growing from here as an organization, so it's only going to become more keys. So the the easy option is to just remove the keys and go to something electronic. The question became, what kind of electronic lock should we get, and how should that lock be uh, operated or maintained? Cloud. Um, Why else would you use? What else would you use? I mean, <laughs> come on, guys. Yeah, so the the uh the officers chat discussion became, you know, should we use a DIY smart solution that would handle like a striker plate or should we go with some like a just a standard non-smart electronic pin code lock or should we get something like a uh, I don't know, like the ring belt, like the ring door lock or something that's smart, you know, cloud platform maintained whatever. And that became a huge discussion mostly because I'm a huge stickler and a pain when it comes to cloud-based solutions and things where we give up control for ease of use. So I kind of wanted to take a little bit of time and kind of get your guys' opinions on the door lock discussion, even though it's already done, but just for the sake of, you know, seeing different viewpoints, I want to see what you guys thought about, you know, the whole decision. Well, you know, why would we not want to use a managed cloud solution? We can log into a website... Somebody deals with all the headaches for us. Everything's fine, right? We just pay the money and it works, right? Yeah, so those who don't know Joe, that's a very rhetorical <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm just saying all that as I'm so, looking at my Pebble watch that barely works now. <laughs> yes, the, the Pebble watches are a great example of a great, great technology that was innovative. And yet they get bought out by a larger company who sees them as a threat and shuts the servers down. So now we have useless Pebble watches, and that's my fear for whatever smart cloud-based lock thing we get. Um, you know, I've already seen too many times now as a software engineer that all these cloud-based solutions are only as good so long as the server is up and running. And, you know, that just, when, you, when you give up the control for a cloud-based solution like this, it's that that decision is completely up to that company whether or not that service is still profitable or they're bored or they just get bought out and shut down and i don't i as a nonprofit you know these locks are expensive and our time is valuable because we are 100% volunteer run that you know whatever decision we make should be something that will literally just last forever until it breaks you know from natural right. causes um but the what did so, we end up? We ended up landing on like a middle ground solution. It was like like a yeah. an e lock that we can manage, right? Right. So we ended up on on a Yale brand um, Z Wave lock, and it, it was fairly pricey. But that's because it's, it's rated for light commercial use, and that was another thing that I really wanted was something rated for commercial use because we we have fifty some members now, and that's only yeah. going to grow. And on a be in a best case scenario, the space gets used every day multiple times, so that door needs to just work. And I don't want it to break and then have to have another lock discussion yeah. next year. And the one of the things that we discussed was having a uh, common code, right? Because we yeah, we talked about my my well, my idea was using a hundred percent non smart pin code lock and just having a rotating code each month. Or just changing it when we have uh, an issue where we need to lock somebody out, we would just immediately change out the locks or change out the code. But a lot of the officers wanted to do individual access codes. We know which is a great you know idea if you can get to that. Um, which I think we are, we actually and our decision will enable that because our lock is not it's not automation required, which a lot of a lot of um, locks required some sort of cloud automation software. The one that we decided we picked was um, it has a Z-Wave radio built in, so it is Z-Wave compatible. And that means it is essentially home automation ready, not right. required. So we it is 100% able to be programmed on the lock itself if we needed to. So 
in the event that we lose all internet connectivity, we can still operate the lock, still reprogram the lock. Oh, but God. you know, we can also add our own. We can add our own um, automation system, whatever whatever system we want, as long as it has a Z-Wave radio in it, and then control it from that. And that was much more acceptable to me that be, because from a control perspective, we maintain the control of the entire system. We're not, you know, using a system that some random company is allowing us to yeah. use until they see fit to shut it down. Well, it, it just really... Every time we talk about putting something like this on the internet, well, one, you just brought up a funny point of we don't have to be on the internet to open our door. Uh, but I always go right? back to the um, Linux sucks discussions that Brian Lunduk did. And he did a whole series of why the internet is going to kill us. And his, his major point that he constantly beat up is why does a crock pot run Linux? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's I would scary. rather it run Linux than Windows. But why does it have an operating system? <laughs> <laughs> it's a crockpot. I mean, I, I prefer my crockpots to run GPL yeah, licensed code. But still, <laughs> you get to that point where, um, funny enough, like my my roommate was working at Sherman's for a little bit, and we went in and saw like the new Samsung line of fridges that are all smart <laughs> hub fridges, and it's like. What you in order to buy this, you almost have to have a 5.0 hertz signal running through your house just to have your fridge yeah. work. Oh, and it's dude. like it's insanity because it's it's running Android, so it technically is running Linux on it. Um, sorta. but it's like you sorta that's why I said technically, <laughs> it is not fully, but technically. Um, but it's it's a crazy thing that we are becoming so reliant on. Um, stuff like that. Like we, I think we discussed in the fir very first episode uh, how I am kind of the closed source noob and uh, buy into all the gimmicks just because I love testing out new technology and I will absolutely be a guinea pig for just about anything. Um, one of the my favorite things and the things I most hate is uh, my Hue lights. Uh, I love my Hue lights. They're freaking amazing. Um, and I can set them to pretty much anything. God forbid my router have a hiccup, though, <laughs> because I will not be able to turn on and off my lights. <laughs> um, so it's like they have overrides and I can obviously like shut them down if I cut the electricity to them. But if I want to dim them or have it to where I have normally, they come up in the morning to actually wake me up. They're, I If my Internet's not working, that doesn't work. And right. so that's. I, I totally get where we're coming to from a part of like having all this very much within our control and not so much relying on somebody yeah, else. That's just crazy. You can't turn your lights. You can't control your lights without Internet. But right. <laughs> this so could be it, a whole episode. It was super funny. You mentioned. <laughs> yeah. So it was really funny that you mentioned the smart fridge because during all of the uh, GDPR hype. Um, there is a subreddit called GDPR fails. What's GDPR? And it, uh, what, what's a global note or something global? Pro it, it's about uh, data <laughs> privacy. I forget what it's even called. But so the idea was, uh, you know, it was a subreddit dedicated to how all these smart devices that just stop working because of the updated terms of service. And so you mentioned oh, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the smart fridge, and there is one that stuck out to me. It's one of those super fancy, you know, full full door touchscreen smart fridges. And a, uh, a, a when when they implemented their GDPR update to the terms of service, you get a pop up on your touchscreen, you know, fridge, and it says, "Hey, we have update our terms of service. Uh, you know, it's up to you to accept the changes. If you don't accept them, this fridge no longer <laughs> operates." <laughs> It's but it's like, I bought the fridge already. I can't hey, return it. You thought you had this fridge. You thought I would dispense water, but you better agree to these terms yeah, of service. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. The terms have been altered. Pray they don't alter further. Right. <laughs> yep. They're yeah, coming so after my milk and cheese next. <laughs> well, you know, or they, you know, somebody starts running a botnet off your fridge. The, the, 
which is a which yeah. is a real thing. Isn't that like the premise of one of the episodes of Silicon Valley? Is they the reason they're able to get their network up and running is because they spread it out to all these fridges. It wasn't an episode. It was a whole season. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like half a season, and it just kept coming back. It was a good recurring theme. <laughs> So yeah, we oh, we ended yeah. up deciding on the non-cloud but still subtly smart lock. And I, we we brought this up because it was such a discussion. Oh man, it was a discussion. Well, it's mostly cuz I was such a stickler because everybody else is, seems too quick to just be like, "Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that." But I'm like, "No, no, no. Let's, let's take some time and think it it's through." It's because we like easy things. Well, <laughs> I I hate myself, so I'd just We're rather learning. go through the the hard effort of you know piecing this out, you know, trying to shoot all the holes through it first, you know, to make sure that the right. idea works. So we had a main topic for the show, and uh, we're actually doing decent on time. So let's let's yeah. talk about it. Um, so uh, I int- I. I brought this topic out and because um, it's been a prevalent uh, concept in all of my making and my projects. Uh, But I learned it uh, while I was learning photography. And as a reminder, the saying uh, that I always keep in my head is do it right up front. So you don't have to do anything in the background. And um, it's general because it applies to so many things, but it was, as I was learning photography, uh, I said something probably stupid and cocky as I did when I was young and I was learning things. Uh, and, uh, the guy that was teaching me use my camera, uh, was like, you know, take your time, set up your shot and, you know, get your settings, right. Get your exposure, right. Get your depth of field. Right. And I was like, ah, we can fix all that in Photoshop. And he was just like, no, stop get it right in the camera now so you don't have to spend any time in Photoshop. You can review your photo and move on and not waste all that time, not recompose your shot, not re-expose it. Um, You don't need raw if you do it right the first time. And uh, that really kind of stuck with me because um, at the time I was trying to learn darkroom work at the same time. And that you know, dark room work was very difficult. There were chemicals that were nasty and you had had to learn basically a second camera with the enlarger and everything. So it was it was very difficult. So you you really did want to get it right up front. And then as I've learning things like welding, you know, if you uh, don't get your welder set up right, all of a sudden you have to spend all this time grinding your weld out. And then it it came up again as we were trying to learn how to set all of our audio settings and everything for this podcast. And if we get our filters set up and our automation set up and our gains on our mics set up, we have to do almost nothing in post to make this sound reasonable, right? So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this it's something I, I try for constantly. Um, and something I wanted to pass along it, it to uh, new makers. Um, yeah. So. No, it, it was it was really cool when we um, were kind of talking about the topics and kind of feeling out what we wanted to talk about in this next episode. This came up and uh, it really stuck with me because it was something that um, I'm facing right now. And one of my projects that I'm working on is getting my fight stick back up and running after I disassembled my arcade. Um, And I noticed something so small that I did, which was I used such a smaller gauge wire on my uh, alligator clips than I really should have. Uh, And it was because I was in a rush and I ran out and got the first thing I could find and threw it on and just got it working for that weekend. Um, When in all actuality, if I would have used just a little bit of, bigger gauge wire soldered it on and then put it on there i would have been in such a better place down the road and not having to fix these problems that i'm having now 
Um, so it was, it was something that like, when we started talking about this, it's like, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Like just do it right the first time. So you don't have to come back and do this again. It, it very much. Well, and like, and it's not even just like do it right the first time, but it's also learn from the mistakes that you've done in the past. So you're going to use the right gauge wire next time because you know, it matters now. So you, you're going to pay attention to that as you're moving forward. And um, the the other thing that uh, resonated with me when he said that, like, don't don't waste your time in Photoshop is I think a lot of the software solutions and um, as tools get better, uh, they, they they've kind of started to make us lazy and uh, we've started to lose skills because of that laziness. And some of that is is fine. You know, we we don't necessarily need to know how to use a dark room anymore because who does? But it's it, it's good. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm 33, and I'd be hard pressed to find people younger than me that could do it. Um, but it, it's still good to understand why we did that stuff and, and why exposure matters and why some of the concepts that we utilized mattered. I, I think it's really important to keep the, the art and uh, those crafts alive. Absolutely. I have done darkroom stuff, Joe, and I'm younger than you. Good. I just want to point well, that I, out. I know they pulled, th <laughs> this was when I was in college, and they pulled the, the darkroom out of the community college by us out like two years after I left. So... It wasn't too long ago. That's okay. A couple of years after I graduated, they tore down my entire building. So I know how it feels. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> They're rebuilding it. It's going to be we were better. We talking about this last night. We got onto another topic. I can't remember what it was now. Are we talking about like auto leveling or something? Oh, no, yeah. Sorry. How? Could, so it was in your same vein of how... With all this, all these automated processes, we're losing the 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 know how and the skills on how to do it right. You know, if if you're you had you had mentioned um, how you know nobody knows how to level a bed anymore because all these new printers have induction sensors or something that will allow them to auto level the bed. And I'm like, yeah, but I I'm also an idiot. I don't know how to level a bed. <laughs> That's why I bought a printer that can auto level, so I don't have to deal with that because I only ever hear these horror stories of it took me an hour to level my bed with a business card. And every time I level one corner of the bed, the next corner is now off and then it becomes yeah, a whole thing. That's true. I, I did think about this afterwards and like most of those creality printers that I hate so, so much now, um, they all come with manual leveling already. So the, the creality users at least know how to manually level their bed until they buy an easy able kit and, uh, you know, put auto leveling on it, which is what one of the things we need to do to the the creality that got donated to us is get that stupid easy able kit on there so we can mesh level that giant <laughs> crowned bed. <sighs> well, and that was I think the biggest thing that you when we were talking about this last was um, you had said uh, do it right up front, um, as in if you're gonna make an engineering mistake don't engineer around mm. it rather fix it first and then use uh upgrades to improve yeah. it and that made so much sense because like it, i think all of us at least work in an engineering field and there's been so many things especially with uh the stuff i work on that i can specifically tell like no this was absolutely something where they messed it up they still shipped it out and then now they're patching it and trying to get it back up and working as best they can. Uh, and that is not the way engineering should be done in any way. Or no, way. It, software fixes for hardware mistakes drive me insane. I, especially when they're simple things like bed leveling. It just mechanically fix the problem. And then we won't have to introduce artifacts to, to fix it. it with your stuff, um, on the projectors and stuff, I imagine that's a a different issue. But um, yeah, <laughs> you know, when the when the fixes are simple, just fix the problem. Like, don't don't try to work your way around it. Uh, that 
that was something right. I always used to get asked in my old job, like, oh, well, the machine's not cutting quite right. Can you guys program around it? And it's like, no, no, that program worked for 20 years. It's going to work again when you fix the machine. <laughs> I'm, I'm not programming around your problems. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen a lot in industry, though, and I think it's it's because, you know, they see software yeah. as free once it's written, you know, and w- once you write it, it becomes more of a fixed cost or the, a fixed cost that you, you know, amortize over the life of that machine. So I've seen it before where, you know, they screw up the wiring diagram or some weird some pins get switched or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, we'll just fix it in software. No problem. Well, you know, if if that's the mentality you approach it with, then you know, by the by the time the product is released, you have all of these concessions you've made because, oh, we'll just fix yeah. it in software. Now, the poor the poor software engineer is like, I have all this crap I have yep. to work around and I can't make a gr- I can't make a great solution because I now have to handle all this extra crap. You know, all this all this extra technical debt that I have that everybody else has yeah. put on me. Yeah, so. I, I remember a, uh, a very specific instance where um, a robot wasn't placing a a gear and a very technical automated cell properly anymore. And I went up to it and I just, I checked the rev date on the program. I was like, program's the same. And all the rest of the positions in this robot are dead on your machine moved. And the guy threw a giant fit. He actually threw a wrench on the floor and he's like, there's no way that machine moved. If it moved, it was a big machine. And I was like, well, it moved. And then we walked around the back of the machine and, uh, The floor was like black from oil, except for two spots that were perfectly square and the same size as the legs where they were perfectly (laughs) clean. (laughs) Look, the machine moved. (laughs) 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 They just kind of looked at me and walked away. They put the machine back in the squares and the robot worked again. (laughs) Amazing. It's amazing how that works. You know, if I would have had to fix it in software, it would have taken me weeks, weeks to get it dead on again because, you know, stuff happens. So, yeah, it's a do it right in camera or in mechanical or in your wiring. Do it right. Or at least learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So when you first mentioned this, I actually took it the wrong way because we hadn't talked yet. And I I kind of interpreted it as more of a transparency uh, rule where, you know, do everything as upfront and transparent as possible so, you know, people don't assume that you're just doing shady stuff in the background. And that's very prevalent, you know, for uh, makerspace directors as, you know, the members kind of entrust us to try and, you know, abstract away all the annoying stuff of, of managing a makerspace. But... It, when it comes down to us making decisions, we need to be as transparent as possible. So, you know, to kind of manage the, the member's expectations and make sure that we're not, you know, introducing, you know, too much bias or, you know, whatever. So it, when you said that, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a great idea. You know, we should be as transparent as possible. But then you start talking and I'm like, oh, that's not at all what you <laughs> wanted to talk about. It, well, it, it, it's all about the priorities. You know, your priority is always freedom and transparency and uh and all that and and, and no, no cloud <laughs> no clouds at rcl whether it's vapes or software no, no clouds <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so yeah so i i believe that wraps up everything we want to talk yeah. about tonight um yeah, yeah, if you guys want to find us on the inner tubes, it's uh, rivercitylabs.space. Uh, we've got social medias on uh, Instagram and Twitter at River City Labs Peoria. Uh, same for Facebook. And uh, oh, we, you know, we never plug meetup. We have meetups uh, for when we have public. Yeah. Meetups. I have worked so hard on that and meetup. And you never page, plug it. And we never yeah, talk so. about it. You can find us yeah. on Meetup as well. Um, and if you're in Central Illinois, we're always down to meet new makers. So come find us out. Um, you know, with that, I'm Joe. I'm Aaron. And I am Christian. Uh, Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. Yeah.
we'll see you next episode.